when you're ready, Doctor Ade. All right. Um, and now this is this is it's glad we're able to do this. I know you all sent in questions um, prior to this time. We are able to you know answer some of them on the day, but we thought rather than send, sending you a written um, answer, um, we thought it might be best to you know capture some of our answers on video so you can go over them again. And fortunately, uh, my colleague, a colleague of mine, Thomas Munzer, has you know graciously agreed to join us. He's the expert in energy transition, in all things energy transition. So it is a pleasure to ha have him. He's a senior lecturer with the University of Aberdeen um, and he will be giving us, you know, starting off with some context and, and definitions just to understand essentially what do we really mean for, um, by energy, energy transition and perhaps some of the implications for developing countries as well. So um, Thomas will just leave um, that background um, for a few minutes and then we'll go into the questions which Tony will be asking. I will provide some insights on, of course, graciously, Thomas is on hand to keep me right. So over to you, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, nice to be here with you. Um, yes, well, the global society, if you will, at the moment is currently undergoing this so-called energy transition. And in some parts of the world, of course, it's more developed than others. In some parts, it's higher on the agenda than others, but there's a general sense of global coherence emerging around this issue of energy transition. And what it really entails is it's, it's chiefly predicated on a gradual transition away from basically fossil fuel-based energy sources by and large. That's the, the general sort of trajectory. So transitioning away from heavy greenhouse gas em emitting sources of fossil fuels. Now, in a sense, that's only half the story because it may be possible to develop technologies that can, in a very sophisticated way, um, sequester, capture, store carbon that's emitted from say natural gas so we're seeing more and more sophisticated technology coming online where there's also a partial shift then to the question not necessarily can we best transition away from fossil fuel sources in x y and z sorts of ways but also can we perhaps have fossil fuels baked into the cake if you like to some extent but also have technology available to mitigate say potentially difficult climate impacts so there are a range of drivers as well that are creating this momentum towards energy transition and one is a concern around anthropogenic climate change so climate change that's driven by uh, human emissions from industrial society and so forth so an effort to mitigate global warming places energy transition high on the agenda but there are also other issues as well um, if you take the uk for example where Aberdeen is based, which Dr. Rifa mentioned. Um, in the UK, for instance, one driver of the low carbon transition is the issue of energy security. And that's quite different from climate concerns. So if you look at the UK, it has you know, rich North Sea oil and gas fields and so on. But by and large, it sits somewhat at the end of a rather tenuous natural gas supply chain. And with that comes some sense of uh, energy and security, policy and security. Now you imagine if you ramp up, say the, the contribution from wind turbines to your energy mix, let's say we're well suited to wind energy in the UK, you find that you have an indigenous energy supply at your fingertips, it's internal and it shields you from some of these energy insecure problems that can arise. So there's another issue and even issues around, uh, part of the rhetoric has been concerned with peak oil in this area. We're dealing with finite fossil fuel sources that could run out and renewables and other energy avenues perhaps provide some solutions there. So all of that is baked into the cake of the low carbon transition and gradually driving this, this uh, energy shift that we see. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, you made a really valid, valid point regarding, um, you know, transitioning and, and the circumstances under which different nations will, will trans, transition. And you see the drivers in, in some cases, you know, we see climate change at the top of the agenda, you know, and in other cases, it's, you know, just a matter of, matter of how do we have secure, you know, secure our energy supply. And, and, and I think somehow in, in some sense, African or developing countries in the global South are somewhat caught in between, you know, because 
there is the climate change implications and then they have huge energy security um, concerns. So I, I think most of the questions being asked is, you know, what kind of regulatory policies or tools can be adopted to find, you know, perhaps strike um, um, that balance. So we will just go straight into the questions and, um, you know, take them one at a time. I know there are 14 questions, so, you know, people shouldn't expect us to go, you know, in depth, but please feel free to contact us after now, and we're more than happy to have further conversations around this. So, Tony, over to you. What's the first question? Okay, thank you very much. Um, question number one says, why do you think there is inconsistencies with the energy transition issues, and what are your thoughts about transition from the African perspective? As we said, we're going to go over some of the questions just to summarize those was those were answered a bit already. Okay, so I remember on my slides I had some you know things on inconsistencies, and um, Thomas has touched on it there, you know, regarding you know the UK and kind of how you see different policies sometimes influenced influenced by politics and 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 all the you know energy security concerns. So in terms of inconsistencies, I was saying. The reality is energy transition is not going to be, you know, a switch where you're just going to switch on and transition on auto automatically for different reasons. Different jurisdictions will transition on the basis of their resources, technology, and all of those things. But for Africa, I think the priority was we haven't actually, you know, of course, there's, there's been some efforts. We see some efforts in Kenya. We see wind turbines springing up here and there, even in Nigeria, even if it's not working. But the reality is there isn't a political will. There isn't that enthusiasm, um, you know, to kind of accept that, you know, transition, energy transition is a reality. Um, you know, of course, you have some stakeholders and, and, and groups, you know, conversing for it. From the political class who, who kind of drive the conversation, um, we are not seeing the kind of enthusiasm for, for energy transition. And, and part of the point I was making is, is that, you know, you see the inconsistencies in the UK, maximizing economic recovery, and at the same time transitioning. You know, there is significant effort in, in, in that regard. We see, um, you know, we see um, Donald Trump in some sense pulling back on, on all the efforts, um, you know, with climate change and, and, and the Paris Agreement and pulling out. And, you know, there are questions, there are certainly questions around that. So those are inconsistencies, but again, th that's the reality. It's not, you know, you're going to have those inconsistencies. But I think the priority for African countries would be, do we realize that this is more than just, you know, an equity question? This is more than just climate change. This is us struggling for survival. And so we need to see a more homegrown organic effort that, energy transition could provide us with all the you know, developmental needs that, that we're seeking. It could provide us with resolve energy poverty concerns. It would provide us with jobs and economic growth. So we need to see if there's something larger and not just a question of you know, a self-imposed transition to, to combat climate change. So that, that's kind of the point I, um, I was making. I don't know if Thomas wants to add on, to, on the implications for, for developing countries in Africa. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you, you provided a, a, a great response there, Eddie. You know, I suppose I would add as well, just to support the good points that you make uh, in terms of these inconsistencies. Yeah, there's a saying in poker, the card game, you play the hand you're dealt. You know that saying where you have certain cards, whether they're strong or weak, you play the hand you're dealt and you try and do the best on the basis of the hand that you're given. And I think something of that is kind of true with energy and the energy transition as well, in terms of exactly what um, Dr. Weefa Eddy, what you pointed to in terms of resources, uh, for starters, with resources to some extent, you play the hand you're dealt. There are some African nations and a variety of nations that have wonderful opportunities in the context of renewables based on their natural resources and their opportunities. There are some other countries that have certain constraints on particular aspects of renewables in the same way that we see some nations with vast oil opportunities, Saudi Arabia and so forth, whereas other nations like Ireland, where I'm from, certainly doesn't have that sort of base. So I think a partial driver of those inconsistencies is that you play the hand you're dealt in the sense that countries tend to have diverse resource bases, and that means there are a diversity of approaches that may be applied 
in the context of renewables I meant, and, and energy and so forth. I mentioned that the UK is very, uh, you know, wind energy provides an opportunity for the UK to maximize some renewables capacities. There are plenty of other, uh, but if you go across the water to Iceland nearby, it's emphasizing geothermal energy. It has a different, it's, it's playing the hand it's dealt, which is slightly different. And I think the same may be true when we move from resources to general policy uh, and institutional structures and development as well. Some countries have different leading edge preoccupations at the moment. Some have different levels of economic development. Some have a diversity of concerns. Some countries are just coming out of serious conflict situations. Others are in those situations. Others have had, um, a, a, say, long periods of stability relative to that. All of those cards that one has dealt can be a profound determinant when it comes to policy as well. So in a sense, inconsistency is, is to be expected. The next question is, what do you do with that inconsistency in the context of low carbon transition? And as Eddie rightly says, <clears throat> one thing one can do is to try and recognize the positive opportunities for economic development that it may provide, opportunities to be forward thinking, to even think radically, to quote Eddie's very good presentation, we talked about radical thinking for positive purposes. So I, I would uh, emphasize those aspects also, you know. Thank you, thank you. All thank right, you. Thank next you question. Very, thank you very much. Um, it says, um, what specific actions do all these economies like Mexico should, what, sorry, what specific actions should all these countries like Mexico take to transit to a just and fair energy transition? So, I mean, again, you know, Thomas knows, you know, you know is, is also an expert in energy, you know, energy justice related issues. But, you know, for oil based economies, like you said, it, it's beyond, you know, switching off. It's a question of we need to begin to ask, we need to start asking ourselves what are more efficient ways of even exploiting for, you know, these these energies for oil even i mean i gave an example of some of the reasons why norway with all the oil gets 99 percent of its energy from 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 hydro all right and then all it does is sell the entire oil and gets all its its energy from hydro and that's because it's looked around and it's got water all, all around so that's you know easily accessible so we need oil-based economies must begin to understand that in fact there might be more easily available energy sources than even the oil we think you know it, it is, is relatively easy or, or cheap again in in terms of you know efficient exploitation of of oil resources what norway is doing and moving into offshore wind for instance it, it wants to use the wind turbines to power offshore oil and gas installations because there's a realization that you know the energy that is exerted when drilling and, and trying to, you know, pump oil is, you know, significant. And so if we could use wind turbines rather than, you know, oil, fossil fuels to power that, that, that drilling process, that's one of the efficient ways of, of, of doing some of these things. Again, we need to ask ourselves, what infrastructure do we have? And how can we, you know, reuse some of this infrastructure for other sources? So some, some, some people are, you know, there's that. Some people are advocating that some of the offshore oil installations could be used for, you know, renewable energy, CCS, carbon capture and storage, even for wind turbine flat platforms and 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 grids. You know, so I think we, there, there are efficient questions. There are questions on efficiency, um, as well as what is the policy direction. I'll leave, um, you know, Thomas to kind kind of add a, add a few words and and look at the just transition question as well. Yes, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I a second what, totally what, what, what you said there. I think one um, useful underpinning principle as well may be in the context of, um, to quote the question, oil-based economy, countries like Mexico, to be careful that there's sufficient diversification of the energy reliance base. There can be a tendency sometimes in oil-based economies say to rely very heavily on oil, which can, call, which can be problematic. Um, we see, per, uh, if you look next door at Venezuela, for example, you see this um, lack of diversification of the base has caused some profound uh, economic problems in Venezuela when it comes to uh, energy issues. Uh, and also a diversification of the base and in partly doing that, it, I think it nudges 
some of those energy systems towards a broader mix, towards thinking about renewables and so on and so forth. And novel regime de uh, design can be useful and interesting in the context of the low carbon transition. So the question mentions Mexico. Mexico put what it calls general law on climate change in 2012 in place, which has it's had mixed results in practice in terms of diversifying its energy base, in terms of expanding its, say, its renewable space, augmenting energy efficiency and so on. But it's made a contribution in the right direction. And one thing it's done in particular is it has helped build confidence in streaming green finance towards Mexico for low carbon projects and so on. So novel approaches like that, including, for example, that Mexican framework, uh, are useful ways in which a just transition can be partially uh, galvanized uh, in the country. So okay. the last thing I would emphasize is, you know, personally, uh, my, my personal feeling, which is correct as far as I could see, is that one needs to be careful that those processes don't exacerbate but mitigate social inequalities when it comes to energy justice. Energy is profoundly bound up with social equity and inequity. I don't go into detail on that, but for obvious reasons, one must be careful that built into those sorts of regime approaches and diversification is a careful sensitivity towards energy justice in the sense of social equity, uh, access to energy and resources and so on. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You said something there, you know, the mitigating parts, very important. Um, I'll just move on to question three. It says, um, so this question says, I agree that we should just, we should jump into the renewable space, but how do African countries make the switch even that the political uncertainty is high in Africa and there's no conf confidence to give investors who are willing to take the risk and deploy these technologies. So, I mean, you know, some of, again, some of these questions would overlap. We've, we've kind of touched on, on some of them while, while answering the others. But one of the things I would say is, you know, for the same reason you want someone to come and invest generally, even if it was in manufacturing, and, and, and or agriculture or in or any sector, um, you need to ensure that those, you know, you have the right investment climate. So it's not a question of energy transition or, or energy or, or, or whatever it is. It's a, it's, it's a question of what is your investment climate like? And if you don't have the right investment climate, even for oil, people would not still invest. So, you know, we are seeing that with, with, with oil, even in Nigeria, we're seeing some of the big oil companies trying to step away, um, you know, and, and, and go into, you know, go into other sectors and, and, and go into other, um, you know, deeper waters and all those sort of things. So you would see a lot of pullback um, if the investment climate is not, is not particularly um, encouraging, if you have conflicts, if you have different groups, militia groups, and all of those things, it's not a question of oil. They would still, you know, they would, they would refuse it to invest. The, the, the only concern I kind of have is now with oil-based economies, they always, there's the likelihood that the resources from oil will be used to, you know, be, will be put back into those, you know, conflict regions. And you would see the oil companies, and we, I mean, I've, exp have, I've seen firsthand experiences where, you know, they, they know that they would be able to pay the militia groups and continue with the oil operations irrespective. So we, we need to be conscious of those things. But priority would be what kind of investment climate you, do you have? Um, but another thing we've seen that has been done in Scotland, and, and I'm sure Thomas would you know, be able to throw in some more light, is the sector deal, all right? So if government policy is geared towards creating an enabling environment, then you can begin to carve out specific unique sector deals so the, you know the same kind of deal you would give a, you know a fossil based company might be different from the kind of deal you would be making with with you know a renewable energy company if that is your policy direction if that is your strategy it would then encourage investment all right so we've seen that play out over and over and over again unfortunately in certain countries we see more subsidies being put into fossil fuel you know subsidizing for fossil fuel when we should be encouraging renewable energy companies so you know that that's the that's the conflict um, I kind of see here. So if your if your energy if your energy strategy is towards having a robust energy mix and encouraging a shift, you know, in that sense as as, as regards energy transition, then try and make very specific, uh, um, unique deals um, for those sectors that you choose to encourage. Okay. 
Um, Thomas, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I'd add, you know, Eddie raised a whole range of great points and in his talk there as well. And I think when we're thinking about this notion of African countries making that switch, um, given that sometimes political certainty may be an issue and there may be investor confidence as, uh, as an issue and so on, that it's undeniable, like anywhere, like my home of Ireland, in some of the African nations in particular, there are some pronounced structural problems when it comes to governance. Uh, some places there are particular problems when it comes to political and social stability that can have a partial, perhaps undermining influence to some extent on investor certainty and so forth. And in each of those cases, and Eddie's a distinguished expert on these sorts of things, there will be, I don't think there'll be a magic bullet or there'll be <clears throat> a general principle as to how to, to correct and improve things just in the way there maybe isn't in Ireland, as say, compared to certain problems in Hungary or whatever it may be uh, in, in Europe, but there'll be sort of bespoke solutions. But one general solution or momentum towards assistance that is separate to those uh, internal circumstances is I think for, uh, in, in particular, the West and developed nations to recognize that they have an important role to play in contributing to the improvement of, let's say, political certainty, to quote the question, or investor certainty, insofar as there is a particular burden in this area on developed nations to assist Africa in low carbon transition practices. The reasons are very simple. The, the developed West in particular has been historically responsible for the lion's share of emissions that have, in essence, caused the anthropogenic climate change problem. And in some cases, it's African nations that will bear the geographic, the natural brunt of that to a much more pronounced extent than the Western nations. So there's a historical moral obligation to assist, but also we've opened up these international green finance flows in this area. Again, there's a burden there on the West to use those meaningfully and in a, in a practical way to assist Africa with its transitioning process, notwithstanding the fact that yes, there are some concerns around political uncertainty in certain parts of Africa and so on and so forth, but it doesn't change the, the burden on the West to assist in equitably distributing green finance flows because again, the West has been chiefly responsible for the primary problem at heart here, which is anthropogenic climate change and Western economies have benefited hugely from the industrial revolution and post-industrial revolution that have spurred some of these difficulties. So in international law, we, we tend to refer to certain principles here, burden sharing as one principle, burden sharing, and also common but differentiated responsibilities. Common but differentiated responsibilities, it's a principle embedded in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So to improve situations and to partially mitigate some of those problems raised in the question in the African context. Part of the solution, I think, yes, very much internal to, to Africa, but part of the solution is also for the developed nations to recognize they have a responsibility to actively assist under these international mechanisms in deploying green finance appropriately, contributing to that investor certainty themselves, because there is a role to play there across the board. So it's a local problem, but it's a global problem all in one, I think, and I think that's partially indicative of problems in this area in general, wherever you look in the world to some extent. Well, thank you very much. I do like the fact that you said, you know, as much as it's an African problem, the developed countries do have a part to play in it. So that's yeah. very useful. Um, the next question says, um, taking Nigeria as an example, over 70% of revenue comes from conventional oil and gas. How, <laughs> how do you develop political, sorry, how to, do you, I'm guessing, develop political will to move investment from oil and gas to something else so like moving investment from oil and gas to renewables how would you suggest i mean i think that's yeah i think that question has already been touched but i mean everybody knows the issue of political will it's not you know there isn't a clear answer to how you know you work around political will but what i used to say is and that was kind of what i was saying you know in terms of a homegrown organic approach um the, you know those who end up holding political office did not fall from the skies. They fall from, you know, amongst, you know, every citizen. So it's a question of 
what is the approach? What is what is the vision from the everyday person there? Do they even understand what climate change is? Do they understand the implications? Do they know that the landslides in, in the eastern part of Nigeria is in, you know has climate change implications? What about the north? Do they realize that the desertification that we see in the north is as a result of climate change? So I think you know before we even start having those conversations of political will, we need to ask ourselves what does the average person understand of the implications for energy transition and the conversation be how how how, how effective are you know non-governmental organizations in driving home these conversations you know at that you know local level once that is missing then we there wouldn't be a political will because you see sometimes here even in the west most of the drivers for energy transition are not particularly governments you know, are not government, particularly government institutions. It starts from everyday people knowing that we need to do something and then it filters, you know, all the way from that bottoms up. So if we do not deal with, you know, that that understanding from the locals, from, you know, non-governmental groups, hoping that they are not, you know, crammed down and shut down and all those kind of things, you need to have that kind of governance environment that encourages that. The absence of that means there would absolutely be no political will even when those people, you know, get to um, hold political offices. Okay, thank you very much. That's interesting to note. Um, Thomas, do you have anything to add to that? No, uh, not particularly. I suppose it, I would just briefly highlight, yes, of course, the, and as Eddie points to, the geopolitical circumstances, especially with relation to energy, are particularly complex in Nigeria. It's a particularly complex internal situation with reference to energy there, and that can pose certain tricky challenges. But perhaps a general way to look at this is, I think, on the downside, and as Eddie pointed to, um, scientific analysis shows that Nigeria could potentially be very seriously impacted in certain ways by unchecked climate change. In some sense, it's slightly on the geographic front line when we look at, if you look at the scientific commentary on projected impacts and with reference to certain nations, there are certain concerns there that uh, pertain to Nigeria. And perhaps that, if that can galvanize some consciousness raising in the country, as with all countries, including mine, consciousness raising can be useful in this area, as Eddie talked about people's awareness. That may be one, one lever to help raise awareness. Uh, but on a more op optimistic note, um, I've seen reporting on Nigeria's potential in the area of renewables. And Nigeria has, for all we think of oil and so on, it has some wonderful potential capacity in the area of renewables, some wonderful untapped natural resources. So that may be a pleasant thought and a cause for optimism in going forward. If, as consciousness is raised, then um, various action can perhaps be mobilized. There, there's a wonderful, beautiful landscape, beautiful country, and there's a, quite a rich resource base in this area that would actually be the envy in many ways many aspects of that landscape would be the huge envy of say ireland where i'm from so there's cause for positivity and optimism in going forward in nigeria as well so that that's all i would point out there okay thank you very much um one thing that popped out to me there is the awareness raising you know just getting an understanding you know right from the bottom up definitely um Next question is, given the state of play and concerning paradox, what political and policy solutions do you propose for state-driven transition efforts in Africa? So, I mean, yeah, I mean, um, if, you, if you look at, I think we had touched on, on, on this question the other day, but I, I think the whole, the whole idea when you look at the paradox and the point I was making um, in, in going through oil sector governance before even discussing energy transition, mm -hmm is that if we're not careful, we will be report, repeating the same mistakes that were made during the time of, of oil sector governance, of, or, you know, oil booms, so to speak, because some countries get the oil, they utilize the resources and they begin to transition. We got the oil, we did not manage the resources and transition is upon us. It's like, you know, I, have, I was making an, an example to, to a friend, I said, it's like someone who was selling then, you know, starch-based foods and now begins to realize that all his neighbors are then beginning to watch their weight or, or are conscious of their diet. And he's stuck with all his, you know, all his resources and almost nothing to do with it. So I think the, the conversation must be, 
you know, what do we do with, you know, what resources we're getting from oil and how can we use that resources to encourage, perhaps in the area of technology, perhaps in the area of, you know, investing in research, perhaps in the area of, uh, you know, investing in community-based um, energy, uh, energy policies, because like I said, it has to be a, a bottoms-up approach. What, how, what are regulatory regimes in terms of decentralization? So, you know, Nigeria as a country is a federal system where everything, you know, almost comes from the top and, you know, very limited powers to, you know, local and, and state-driven um, agencies. So how do we decentralize and liberalize the market in such a way that, you know, if you, a community in, in, in the north or in the south or in the east may be able to generate their own electricity and be able to handle perhaps connecting it to the grid in some sense, like we see, you know, being done in Scotland and, and Thomas will be able to throw some light on it. So I, I think, you know, Organically, we need to be conscious of the mistakes we've made and avoiding, avoid repeating them. But we need to have regulatory um, policies that, one, encourage decentralization, that invest in research and technology and education, because that's how some of these things started. All right, people built a wind turbine and studied it and understood. Okay, if we if we did this with one, maybe it was a small one, and we see the wind turbines. If we look at the lifespan of the wind turbine how exponential, it's, it's massive, but it didn't start that way. And that was because people just started by understanding what it really is. And if you're able to invest that way, it means you would not need Forex to be able to import, you know, the technology or, or get people from, from, from the West to do that because you already have it, which is one of the problems we are seeing when we need Forex to import oil. <laughs> so you can imagine, so I see the mistakes, we've got to repeat itself if we're not conscious. We have the oil, but we spend, foreign exchange importing refined oil if you if you're not conscious you would have the energy resource so you would have wind you would have solar but you spend forex asking china or england or the uk or germany to come back and build the wind turbines so we're going to repeat this mistake so it's going to be a cycle it might not be today but give it five ten years twenty years we will be back to same sport so until we begin to invest in the things that really matter so that our schools, our university, our research and innovation institutes will begin to engage with the transition conversation and begin to test run and build these things, we will be back to square one in no time. Interesting. Um, Thomas, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, not particularly, except to support and echo what Eddie's such a distinguished expert on those issues and made such a great range of points across his has the formal element of his lecture as well. I just, um, I think Eddie's message should be listened to. I think it's important, very sensible. And one thing that struck me in particular was Eddie during the course of his lecture, emphasizing there may be a need to think radically. I think that was your term, Eddie, <laughs> yeah. radically. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe a lesson for our times because the energy transition, be it Africa, be it Ireland or the UK, be it anywhere you want to point to on a map, uh, is requiring radical change, and that's true in Africa. Radical thinking will be required. It's true where I'm from, and I think that that uh, partial essence of Eddie's message is goes to the heart of circumstances in Africa, but also is maybe a universal uh, truth for all of us in a sense at the moment. That's, that's very saying. interesting. Thank you very much. You know, in terms of talking about the radical change, we need to definitely be a bit more forward thinking in what we're doing, you know, I found out that a lot of times we're kind of like stuck in the moment without actually projecting towards the future. Um, the next question says, following you on- You might need to skip it. That's, 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 um, that should be for boss's question, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can answer your own question. <laughs> that's, your, that's your question. Um, you might need well, to skip that one. <laughs> the next one too is the bulky one, and I think she talked about it already, and you answered yeah. it. Um, the yeah. next question says, how will private firms and professionals within the energy space champion the implementation of strategic policies that encourage sustainable energy technology solution towards energy transition? I mean, I think certainly private firms, are, again, professionals have, have a role to play. And, and we see that happening with um, even the big multinational companies. You know, you, you see that, conscious, that awareness um, and, and that shift, you know, BP is saying it's going to invest X, Y, Z in, 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 you know, in low carbon energy. We see no Equinor now, um, you know, putting aside um, about 
two point something billion euros for you know for carbon capture and storage. So we, we're beginning to see you know that change, and you know if 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 countries and and again that's because it's of a certain level of pressure. All right, that that's on one hand it's an economic decision. So people think you know when oil companies or oil multinationals do that they they're losing money no 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 they're not they are actually still diversifying which is essentially what oil companies do they diversify they prepare for the future where is the money so if it means building several you know wind turbines then they would build it if it helps them balance out their carbon emissions then they would they would build it as well as make money so we're seeing you know very big oil companies in you know doing things like that so i think there is that you know, awareness as a result of pressure um, from, from, you know, groups and, and governments in, in this sense. Again, we are beginning to see that even in terms of investments, you know, I think it was the European Bank and some other institutions pulling back on investments on, 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 on fossil fuel based, uh, uh, um, you know, um, contracts or deals. So we are seeing that. So, you know, very, those little things in the long run does pay off. We're seeing a lot of investment, you know, by private firms supporting research and technology development in these areas and, and, and in different aspects of, of, of the energy transition game. I think those are efforts that will be, will be, should be encouraged and, con, and, and should continue. And then we are seeing some behavioral changes from, 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 the, from the part of, of the multinationals or, or private firms as, as well. So, you know, the, I, saw, I saw a researcher said they would then begin to have, um, you know, transparent, um, transparent solar panels. And so, you know, companies, private firms want to build their entire, you know, the glass house, you know, structures want to be built with transparent solar panels. And you can imagine, you know, so they they basically have glass all over the property, but th that's actually generating their energy. So we're seeing that, well, you know, that may be in the future, but we're seeing where the research is heading and how companies are investing, you know, in, in, this, in this technology, be it Google, be it Amazon, be it, you know, we're, we're seeing them driving the conversation. And, and in terms of data, these private firms have some of these data, they have some of these expertise. And once they're pushing all those resources in, perhaps that would help, you know, push the energy transition conversation a bit further. And we're hoping that this doesn't just happen in the West, but it also happens in parts of Africa. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Thomas, do you have anything to add to that as well? Yes, I, I just briefly, yes. I mean, I think this notion embedded in the question of private firms and professionals championing approaches within the energy space kind of speaks to that theme of an opportunity as well for entrepreneurial behavior within the energy sphere, um, the capacity to innovate. If you're a company, maybe let's say a smaller company working in the low carbon energy space, and you're trying to breaking through and innovating and so on, there's a rich emerging market for that type of firm or body of professionals. So energy, that energy space has never really been so lively for say, let's say a private company that may want to develop or implement um, a certain method or tool within that sphere. Not that there aren't uh, market challenges and barriers too, but there are opportunities there. And in America in the literature and academic literature or media, you hear quite a bit about the, the so-called green dollar and things. And um, there is money there for firms and professionals that can innovate in that space and there are financial incentives but in terms of a particular interesting point embedded in the question this notion of uh, championing the implementation of strategic policies i think that again speaks to an important theme championing the implementation of strategic policies that will encourage sustainability sustainable technologies that's a reminder i think that it can be useful in this area to try and articulate that strong sustainability message. Even if you're a private company trying to develop some kind of low carbon method or tool um, or mechanism that can be implemented or machine or whatever it may be, that message as well, articulating that sustainable message is, is key. It helps drive and move the market cumulatively. It helps raise consciousness, uh, but also there, there has been rather a concerted identifiable pushback against the low carbon transition on the part of certain sort of powerful actors and institutions and some of them are are moving now but you see in my field I'm, I'm a policy person but also in law um, some legal cases are sort of mobilizing to try and push back on that so for example right at the moment Keith Ellison 
who's the Attorney General in Minnesota, the state in America. He's opened litigation against ExxonMobil, uh, American the American Petroleum Institute, and the Koch brothers due to what he's characterizing as a campaign of deception, so kind of mixing messages and, and so forth in this area. Now, whether or not that will be successful is another question, but it speaks to this theme of championing the implementation of strategic policies, pushing that message, because it's quite a contested space. Uh, so that's worth, I think, remembering and emphasizing. I think it's a very good question that was asked. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question, there's a lot of stories behind for it, but the main question there says, um, do you think decentralization could be an answer to, sustainable, to sustainably roll out the energy transition in Africa? Yes, I, I mean, I mentioned that you need decentralization you need liberalized markets you need I mean I, I don't do a lot of the downstream stuff I have I have a very good friend and colleague who, who does downstream stuff perhaps you know Thomas but yes you need a de decentralized and, and, and liberalized market um, and that's something you know um, that, that should be encouraged because without that you would not have this homegrown organic approach to to energy transition it would be you know stuck with just what government says and government policies so i had mentioned that earlier what do while answering one of the questions that yes i think i think we should have a decentralized market okay thank you very much thomas any additions to that yeah just i mean that makes excellent sense and yeah i think as well when you think of decentralizing energy as an actual apparatus you think uh, we obviously have great problems with in terms of energy access and so forth in certain parts of Africa, especially sub-Saharan Africa. And think of the opportunities that may accrue where you can, instead of dealing with big power stations and so on, you have opportunities provided by solar cells, solar energy uh, and so forth. So it's worth thinking broadly about how opportunities for decentralization in a general sense in the context of the low carbon transition may allow us to more greatly democratize energy use, if I can put it like that as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I do like that word, the Mercotrep tax. Sorry, I'm <laughs> twisted. Um, the next Mercotrep question. Says. The next question says, what roles could indigenous oil and gas company play in energy transition? I think, you know, that's yeah, been we've, just done. We've answered that. Mm -hmm. So um, next question says, what are the prospects for more integrated inter-regional solutions in the continent? Any opportunities for wider interconnections, common strategies that tend to be more efficient than actions on the national level only? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there should be, um, you know, perhaps an African and AU strategy. strategy. Um, I was trying to find, you know, do we have a coherent, um, African Union strategy on on energy policy and energy tr transition, um, and it was it was a it was a bit of a struggle. You see, you know, a few messages here and there, but there isn't any clear strategy. Again, for political reasons, African Union is completely, you know, it's structured a bit different, you know, in some ways than you would have with the EU, um, you know, arrangement. So it, it makes things increasingly difficult. But we are seeing with the, you know, perhaps with initiatives like the Africa Free Trade you know, um, Agreement, uh, in that sense, if we have that going, perhaps that may feed into this need for a more you know, um, regional approach to energy strategy. And in that sense, we'll begin to understand that what affects one affects all. Uh, and so there, need to, there needs to be that coherence. And so we pull back, we pull together resources um, in that sense. Of course, you know, there are challenges with African Union. <laughs> They are still battling, you know, um, you know, different countries operating completely different from from one another. So you, you you know you don't have the kind of you know the democracies or the political structures that are uniform. You don't have that kind of uniformity in political structure. So it it, it might impede communication and and the kind of growth you know we we kind of wanted to see. It's funny you know, but you know someone like. Gaddafi was trying to have a united Africa. And of course, you know, while the intentions appeared, you know, to, to be honest, but the approach and the style, and perhaps there were certain conflicts even with the person who was proposing it himself, you know, so, so all that kind of made everything, you know, increasingly difficult. And we know the history, you know, we, there's, there's Gaddafi is no more. So, you know, Africa is really 
position as a has a really complex governance structure that makes it particularly challenging to have a more holistic regional approach. Having said that, I think, irrespective of you know the the, the, the you know political structure in, in in these countries, there has to be that realization. So you know the issues around energy transition and the conversations we're having, it's independent of you know, democracy, we're saying, you know, China is saying it's going to be carbon neutral, you know, by, by 2060. And, and so that, you know, it, it has the sort of political structures that we see in parts of Africa. So it's more than, you know, the political structure. It's about that understanding and that, that acceptance that, you know, the future is here. And until we plug in, um, we will we will be pulling, you know, lagging behind. So I, I think there has to be that realization how we in how we can manage the conversation within the African Union is particularly complex, but I don't think it's impossible. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, just to add, it's actually 15 questions, not 14. Apologies. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Thomas, do you have anything to add to that? Well, maybe just briefly with reference to renewables in particular, which we've raised over the course of our conversation, because obviously it has some significance for the low carbon uh, transition. Uh, in Africa 2030, which is the policy report by um, IRENA, mm -hmm. the International Renewable Energy Agency, which looks in detail at um, renewables and going forward. In, in the third chapter of that, which deals with strategic planning, there was quite a bit uh, there's quite a bit of ink spilled around this idea of um, integration across the continent and you know strategic kind of unity in developing um, renew uh, renewables rollout across jurisdictions and so on. So this sense of as one develops renewables and going forward, it's done on a, a communal strategic basis, ideally where possible. And there's the, because the question was raising this prospect for the more integrated interregional solutions or however it was phrased um, given that renewables are are beginning now to emerge and get up ahead of steam i think it's useful that policy reports like that when it comes to strategic planning and framing are typically uh, recognizing particular needs for integration and to bake those into the cake of the strategic plan and perhaps there's a broader lesson there for energy in general to to try and recognize those wider opportunities where possible and fold them in. And that, as I say, that that does seem to be happening to some extent with renewables, um, which is is promising. And I just think the last thing I'd say as well, there's a, um, a another layer perhaps to the question when we're thinking about more integrated solutions that transcend a particular state. Um, we must keep in mind as well green finance, because that's fundamentally international now where um, various finance streams have been opened. One small example to be concrete about it is under the Kyoto Protocol at the international level. One of its major mechanisms it developed, it's an international piece of law under the UNFCCC framework, has been the clean development mechanism where there's an incentive for developed countries to fund renewable projects or other low carbon projects or it could be carbon capture and storage projects in developing nations like Africa. So um there's an issue there as well of cumulatively working to perhaps benefit from strategic international green finance as well in a common way okay. and just to add i mean if if we're going to maximize you know or make the most of the energy transition you would see that some of the solutions may be perhaps to move offshore and so once you begin to move you know into you know into an offshore terrain then you begin to realize the need for that sort of strategic holistic approach because of course you start dealing with other you know offshoots and implications of of moving you know into such spaces so you know if we realize so you begin to realize that there are implications and benefits from that sort of strategic approach Thank you. Thank you very much. I was going to say in terms of, you know, spring from this, you know, might be something to consider because we did a study on just what kind of green finance are available out there. There's quite a lot in terms of, you know, as you said, small companies coming up with these things. There's a lot of resources out there just to point out. Um, next question says, could a failure to get involved in technology be a result of failure of technology transfer and how can we bypass this? Yeah, I mean, I was having this conversation with, with TT and we're, we're trying to work around the research, um, you know, question on, on technology transfer 
in, in, in Africa. Um, you know, the reality is the technology doesn't particularly exist with, you know, within Africa. And so if you're gonna build all these infrastructure and all these wonderful, laudable projects, the question is where does the technology come from? Um, technology transfer is, 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 you know, is an issue and there are IP concerns around it. But um, I think in some sense, there are ways to get around it. So you know, if you create the right, for instance, investment climate, um, then perhaps we would be able to have you know in, in, introduce that 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 technological requirement. Of course, there are broader IP related questions around it, and you know I'm not 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 an IP expert, but I think like we mentioned before, even locally, even locally, there are steps that can be taken to get involved and, and understand the technology. We see it through you know value chain and local content policies to kind of you know to 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 get ahead of the game. If we don't see that happening across our research and innovation and you know institutions, there's absolutely no way we can break the barrier. We will be stuck. I mean, several decades after we are we are pleading with China to help build infrastructure and rail, rail and and all of those things for us now. And and that's the point I make that if we do not get involved, we will be asking them to do the same thing in 20, 30, 40 years. So of course there are technological and IP related issues. But that can be bypassed by, you know, indigenous companies getting involved and, you know, putting in, investing in innovation and, and research. And we see that happening in, in, in parts of Africa. I mean, I think there was, there was, there was, a, we're seeing com indigenous, indigenous companies building cars. We're seeing, I think there were some students who tried to build a plane, you know, didn't particularly go over. But we see some of those indigenous efforts. Those are the things we should be championing. We know the story of the guy who built a, a wind, a wind um, turbine, you know, for his community in his village somewhere in Eastern Africa, just so that they could listen to the football matches and watch football matches. So we need to kind of encourage that kind of thing. We, we shouldn't always rely and sit back and expect that, you know, at some point, you know, they would invest because they, you know, that's what companies do. We need to begin to shift, you know, get ahead and, and take charge of the narrative. Okay, thank you very much. And um, Thomas, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, well, I'd just sort of echo and support what uh, Ellie said, give a very good, rich answer. There, there is in, in the literature occasionally, in sort of academic scholarly literature, one sees this notion that uh, in Africa and elsewhere, there are, Again, it's with reference to renewables in particular, but there is a, um, there are options and resources there, but there are impediments to rolling out the appropriate technology, and therefore it's sometimes conceptualized as a technology gap. So as if there's this gap between the capacity and the technology, and that gap must be closed. And again, it's just another way of conceptualizing the things we were just talking about. But it also raises the question, who closes the gap? Someone's got to close it. And as Eddie's pointed to, that opens up a lot of complex market questions and so on and so forth. But it, it seems to me in basic terms, um, Africa, of course, has a major role to play in closing the gap. But so in particular does, I think, the developed West, which has um, often a lot of this technology in places, certain restrictions, whether it be in the context of intellectual property, a whole range of um, investor lock-in and other various uh, devices. I think there's an obligation there for the West to assist in particular in closing that gap with, in, in this case, um, the African nations. So a lot of people and parties have a role to play and that gap can be closed. It didn't fall from the sky. We've effectively created it via regulatory regimes, um, complex international investment frameworks, uh, and so on and so forth. So that can be closed, and morally it should be closed. Um, Africa has a part to play, but so do other nations that are placing impediments and restrictions on the closure of that gap, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Just to put a bit of slant on this, we're talking about technology gap and technology transfer. I notice, especially in Aberdeen, I work within Aberdeen City Council, there's a lot of skills gap as well. And you're finding out, you know, people predominantly is oil and gas, and there's a lot of renewables coming up. The relevant skills within the oil and gas that could be transferred to, you know, renewables as well. So just to note that, you know, it's probably more of a discussion for another day, but that just popped into my head. Um, next question is, in the Industrial Revolution, the rich countries multiplied their population, creating a big problem of resources. Do you think that 
that thriving should be constrained by political control. I'm quite sure. By population that. control. Yes. So they're basically saying industrial revolution in the rich countries multiplied was multiplied by population, created the big problem of resources. Now it's not asking, do we think that you can constrain that by population control? Not quite sure I get that. That's not a conversation that I would want to get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not population stuff. <laughs> I, I I certainly don't want to get, get into those that sort of question. I, I already have two kids and I don't know what will happen <laughs> next. So, 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 so where does the control come from? Who breaks the brakes? You, you know, I mean, there, there are larger, you know, complex issues um, around that. And we see, I mean, we see the African population, um, you know, growing exponentially. Um, but I think it's, a, it's because of lack of strategy, lack of planning. Um, I mean, if I'm going to have another child, I must ask myself, do I have the resources to take care of, of those children? And so if I don't ask myself that question and I end up with, you know, several, you know, kids and I'm unable to fend for them, then it's, it's my problem, you know. So once you don't have strategy and you don't have, you're not forward looking and forward thinking, then you start having this sort of constraints where the population grows and you don't have enough energy, you don't have enough food, you know, there's food poverty and all the other economic issues that occur as a result of population growth. So I'm not to say, you know, control your population, absolutely not. I am to tell you to strategize and plan. If you don't do that, then you would have issues. Okay, that's very interesting. Thomas, do you have anything to add to that? I'm glad Eddie took that one for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, in Nigeria or in Africa, they would tell you that, you know, you don't plan for children, you come with resources from heaven, I beg to differ. <laughs> Well, um, that's what has gotten us to where we are, hasn't it? <laughs> it is, it is. As you said, you need to, you need to plan, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, the next question says, petroleum production is profitable in Nigeria, mainly because it's exported to foreign buy buy buyers. Gas sales in Nigeria, gas sales to the Nigerian domestic market is uneconomic due to bad payment culture. How do you plan to transit from petroleum to wind power and get Nigeria domestic market to pay for this wind power? That's quite specific, isn't it? No, I mean, we're, we're beginning to see, you know, the technology has evolved and, and, and the systems are, are evolving and infrastructure is, is, is being developed. And, and we're seeing, you know, um, the price of, of, of energy, particularly from wind, you know, the cost of energy being, you know, being, you know, grew, slowing down, you know, we're seeing that reduction in, in energy cost. So, you know, the initial concerns was, of course, you know, this is expensive. How, how do we manage it? But again, we're beginning to see that because people have gotten involved, because people have understood the technology, because the people have made, you know, sector deals that have made the technology, the, the, the industry grow, wind particularly is, you know, is, is getting low and beginning to compete in some sense, you know, with, with fossil fuels. So I think the cost and economic concerns that were raised about, you know, energy transition are being, you know, resolved in some sense by um, the growth, the growth in the industry. So I, I wouldn't share the concerns um, that that um, that he has. In fact, it's a it's a better reason to transition because we do not have functional infrastructure to refine the petroleum products that we have in country, and so we are importing <laughs> we are importing those those petroleum products. So you then begin to realize what can I use in country that does not need the kind of refinement that, you know, that, that has to be done from, from, from overseas. Of course, renewable energy provides that answer because, you know, there's nothing to do. It's got to be there. You're going to do it and you're going to, you know, send, send the energy out. So it, 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 in fact, that is an opportunity for the government, you know, to take advantage of. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Thomas, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I think, you know, Eddie has great expertise there and has an answered that very well. well. Just one thing that would jump out is me without his rich level of expertise in that particular narrow point is that the question, it raises it, this interesting theme again of uh, what, and what Eddie, I think, pointed to in his talk very well, this idea of energy justice or energy democracy. Um, it points, it's, it says gas sales to the Nigeria domestic market are uneconomic 
due to bad payment culture. I don't have any particular comment on that directly myself, but that notion of bad payment culture is interesting. And then when it asks, how do you plan to transit from petroleum to wind power and sort of circumvent those problems? On a point of general principle, uh, where there may be, I don't pass any comment on that directly. I don't have any specific narrow expertise there, but where there may be some inequities. So here we're thinking about energy justice, energy democracy built in to an energy market model, in this case, the person suggesting gas sales in Nigeria. When we come on to renewables, talks about wind power, one can, I think, try and screen what one does or in going forward in the fossil fuel energy sector to try and pair out those energy inequities that often are typically built into energy structures. So to be specific, the person talking about bad payment culture with reference to gas, sales with wind power which is a newer it's the new kid on the block as it were in that context uh, if you look at some countries like say denmark which pioneered a rollout of wind energy what they have done to try and partially mitigate these sorts of energy inequities what you might call a bad payment culture it's not quite the same thing but they devised a sophisticated system where communities have uh, buy-in options and ownership options over uh, part of wind turbine revenues and things. So as a general point, why I'm, Eddie's dealt with the narrow issue really well, it raises a meta issue of how to avoid, in the context of the low carbon transition, importing potential inequities and inequalities into our energy systems as we develop and go forward, be it fossil fuel, renewable, nuclear, whatever it is you're talking about. Um, so I think it's just worth emphasizing that point. And we can look at places like Denmark with wind power and not perfect by any means, but we have frameworks and models that are being rolled out that may inspire us in Africa or wherever we may be to try and absorb some best practice models. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, last question, thankfully. Considering the dangers of climate change and global warming due to the use of fossil fuels, um, do you think there is time do you think there is time and possibility of a continental or global strategy that can put in place, that can be put in place so that countries with abundant fossil fuels can be used to generate funds, which can then be used to invest in the green home grown transition for these countries without a break, breakdown in the economies of these countries? I mean, I mean, it's a yeah, it's a long question, but I mean, it's all around you know sovereignty and and you know what what countries, I mean, countries have sovereign rights over their natural resources, and you know it's not for one country to tell another what to do um, with its resources and you know what to do with you know with its money um, or or the funds from those resources. It's it's a question for those those countries to identify. We've got this much. How do we manage and and utilize it? So it's it's so there's that point. But again, in terms of a global or continental strategy, I mean, at the global scale, we've got we've seen you know regimes under uh, UNF Triple C, uh, you know, and, and and all those sort of regimes that kind of encourage. Um, and that in terms of diversification and, and use of renewable energy sources. And I mean, I'll, I'll let Thomas um, throw some more light on, on the global um, regime. But we see also in the EU, that there is a clear energy strategy. And, and you know, we see individual countries keen into that. I mean, on, again, like I said, the EU runs a, a completely different regime than Africa, where, you know, once something is agreed at, at an EU level, um, there is, you know, that, that consensus so to speak, where each individual country is beginning to buy in and, and replicate um, at, at the national level. So, but we don't have that sort of structure, you know, in 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 in, in Africa. Um, which, but con again, back to the point that when we consider the impact of climate change, there should be, you know, that continental effort. But I'll let Thomas, um, you know, discuss, you know, the global efforts so or the global regime, uh, and and then the EU strategies as well. Uh, yes, sure, Eddie. Um, yes, there, so the, there has been, as, as Eddie pointed to, the UNFCCC, for example, there, there has been, uh, it's been slightly slow, slightly faltering, but nonetheless meaningful development of an international regime in this area. And the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that Eddie mentioned, um, was set in place in 1992 and 
the vast majority of the international community is behind it and has signed up. And it, it provided a sort of consensus agreement that we need to deal with climate change as an international community. It's an international problem, created monitoring and reporting facilities. It was relatively soft and light in terms of robust content. And since then, the international regime has, has developed and evolved a bit. And without running through it, we had the Kyoto Protocol that I mentioned earlier in our talk here in 1997, and there have been some other developments, the Doha Amendment to the Kyoto Protocol in 2012, and the, the famous much vaunted Paris Agreement, which is 2015. So we've had these, these developments, and they've, they've gradually moved the international community towards some coherence uh, in this area. It tends to be based on consensus and a desire to act together, as opposed to a top-down imposition of standards and drivers on nations below the international level. So, and, and that can be useful. It's, so it's quite soft, weak law, frankly, but there's a collaborative feel and it's appropriate that it would be, with reference to Africa, I think, um, certainly appropriate that it would be quite soft and collaborative. There's, there's certainly no call for an international regime to emerge that would try and impose on Africa a requirement to do very, very difficult things with its energy system when there are certain bespoke economic problems there and energy justice isn't as richly developed as it might be with access to, to energy and so on. So I think as, as Eddie says, there's a global strategy emerging, but it has a bit of a bottom up feel where states are sort of required to try and do what they can do. But packaged around that are those notions I mentioned earlier of burden sharing and common but differentiated responsibilities. So in the case of Africa, let's say, uh, there's, there's this onus placed by the framework on developed nations to try and assist and try and be supportive, which I think is appropriate, rather than try and impose some kind of regime on nations that haven't really, in essence, caused the problem in the first place, at least with climate problems. Those are really predicated off the back of the Industrial Revolution, and Africa didn't enjoy the fruits and benefits in the way that the developed West did. Now, what the e EU has done in terms of the international regime, the European Union, it has, and this is an interesting model for perhaps African thought and development, it has absorbed the international regime and effectively said, this is fairly weak, fairly light touch stuff, but we agree that it should be acted on. We think it's important. So we're going to lock it into EU law. So when you come down from the, if you're in the UK, when you come down from that soft international regime and get to the EU's absorption of that regime, you've got some very robust, uh, you have a very robust legal framework. You've got legal directives, some of which have key components that are enforceable in courts. So perhaps, um, what Africa, a general strategic approach with reference to the question may be for African nations to keep thinking coherently, come together as best they can and see what they can make of that international regime in their terms that have been imposed on them and against the backdrop that support um, is, should be forthcoming insofar as, as we say, a lot of the difficulties under, underpinning this area have been sort of foisted on some nations like Africa through the industrial revolutionized West and so forth. So within that context, then I think you can get to asking the heart of that question, which is the question asking, is there a capacity to really develop a bespoke mechanism where you can take some monies from fossil fuel development and deploy it in the green economy? It's a very important question, but it's quite a, a micro issue within that broader, uh, broader sphere. And that perhaps is a useful context in which to ask it, what can the Af African nations do coherently themselves? on their own terms with reference to that issue. Um, so, yeah, okay. I mean, thank you very much. That was really depth, in depth. And now I think almost we should, we should do a research or, or do a paper on something. Of so all these things we've discussed today. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, love to. Definitely. Definitely. Thank, thank you both very much for your time. And um, I will call it this and send to all the attendees from the event. And um, I do appreciate you taking time go through these questions with us. So have a lovely day.